now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet, and they have again today. Coming up, United We Stand, the Labour Party annual conference finishes up without fracas as hardliners are persuaded to keep a lid on it ahead of the federal election and industrial relations stays light on detail, although interesting developments there. AWU Secretary Dan Walton joins us for his take on the Labour conference and Labour's policy positions. What a year for big business. The business Council of Australia Chief Jennifer Westacott reflects on 2018, the factors that impacted corporate Australia the most and how business leaders are seeing the year ahead. And the wheeling and dealing in the last 12 months, the Australian data room's Scott Mur Mur Murdoch takes us through the big stories on the M&A front this year. Well, phew. Final day of the Labour Party National Conference and it's wrapping up pretty much as Labour leaders intended it would. A remarkably disciplined affair, really. They had a bit of luck, too. The government's attempts to take the shine off the conference by uh, that Sunday announcement of the new Governor-General, but especially my EFO, where the government's $9 billion election war chest announced was well and truly nuked by an own goal. National Party MP Andrew Broad's sex scandal exposed in the pages new idea. As Caroline Overington writes in the Australian Day, it gives new meaning to the coalition being at broad church. The coalition, she says, is forever going on about what a broad church they are. Broad overboard for broads abroad, she quipped. But back to Labour. Today, not one but two former Labour Prime Ministers were made, three actually, made life members, but only one of them, Kevin Rudd, turned up with the very formidable Julia Gillard, as Kevin Rudd described her, politely declining. All part of the new unity ticket, you'd think, and uh, the discipline that Labour has right and left are signed up to. We could hardly have a reminder of those divided years of Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, with both Bill Shorten and Labour President and world's best treasurer Wayne Swan on stage too. No, no. We've had our occasional disagreements, just here and there, at the margins. But you know something? We've all written our bit, and I just have a simple suggestion. Let's let history be the judge of these things. And I base that also on a pretty simple view that the values which unite us as a Labour movement, as a Labour party and as a trade union movement are infinitely broader and bigger and greater than any single ambition which may individually divide us from time to time. And there was, of course, a moment where Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan, who fell up big time over Bill Shorten's power grab, shook hands. It was the handshake they had to have, a united front with the potentially controversial issues of asylum seekers, the NEG and super all well aired. <coughs> Excuse me, today was the day for AIR with a broad agreement that Labour in office would bring back penalty rates, perhaps most concerning for business, the idea that industry-wide bargaining would be brought back not just in low-income cases, which is what the talk was in the lead-up to the conference, but wherever collective bargaining fails. Here's Shadow IR Minister Brendan O'Connor. If elected, a shortened Labour government will improve multi-employer bargaining, particularly for those workers, so it is an effective pathway for fair outcomes. <laughs> Labor's workplace laws will ensure every worker has an appropriate vehicle to bargain with their employer to get their fair share of economic growth. Where enterprise bargaining has failed or is failing, multi-employer bargaining should be another available option. We will focus our industrial relations laws to protect workers' safety and their rights, not to create conflict, not to pursue vendettas, and not to stage police raids for the benefit of TV cameras. This is Australia, not a tin-pot dictatorship, and that is why we will abolish the ABCC and the Registered Organisations Committee. Labor also wants to sort the gender pay gap with the Fair Work Commission retooled to look at wages not just within sectors but between sectors like childcare and metalworking. In the case of childcare, it also appears that the Labor government would fund the difference. Now, there's clearly a move to reset wages at sectors at the bottom of the pile, 
but the details are yet to be spelt out. Whether this is then a slippery slope for broad-scale pattern bargaining that some on the union side would like to see, we don't really know. All in all, though, it's another week that the government would like to forget. Front page news on the wrong kind uh, of news as uh, today. It's not my IFO, but former front bencher and sugar baby user Andrew Broad announcing he will not be recontesting the next election. Well, first, let's kick off with some big global news. Chinese President Xi Jinping has today addressed his nation from Beijing on the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up. Well, for a recap of the president discussed, uh, what the president discussed in his speech, let's cross live now to Bloomberg's China correspondent, Tom McKenzie, outside the Forbidden City in Beijing. Now, Tom, did uh, President Xi say anything that would alleviate trade tensions? And, Uh, essentially, the answer is no. There will be business leaders uh, and investors both here in China and abroad who will be pretty disappointed that President Xi didn't use this opportunity around marking the 40th anniversary of reform and opening to push through further structural reforms or to open up additional parts of the market here to appease not just the hawks in Washington who want to see additional measures from China, but also those domestic players and companies here as well who want to see a level playing field. What we got from President Xi was a recapping of the historical impact of reform and opening over this 40-decade period, or four-decade period, I should say, including what he said was an annual growth on average, about 9.5%. He said that they have lifted the Communist Party 740 million people out of poverty. What he didn't really talk about was the private sector, the role of the private sector and the role of market forces, just fleeting mentions of those. So this will be, as I say, a concern for business leaders and investors uh, looking to President Xi to address uh, some of those concerns out of Washington, but also the increasing domestic economic pressures that China is facing. Yeah, so where does the focus now shift for, for investors and business leaders looking at China, do you think? So really the focus now shifts to an annual economic meeting that takes place here in Beijing and starts on the 19th of December, wraps up on the 21st of December. It is expected to outline and policymakers are expected to outline their priorities for the economy for 2019 and there is an expectation from economists and analysts that we've been speaking to that we're going to see policymakers outline additional stimulus measures to support the economy here as for example the auto sector slows as real estate sector is under pressure retail sales have started to drop as well so stimulus is going to be squarely in focus for those watching over the next few days in Beijing and also any measures from the central bank here as well to provide additional supportive measures uh, to the economy again there's domestic economic pressures and then of course those trade headwinds that China has to face up to. Great. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie there. Nice to talk. Well, the Business Council of Australia yesterday issued its official response to MyEFO. The BCA says it's concerned about the future of business investment in Australia with investment growth revised down to only 1% this financial year. In a statement yesterday, Business Council says that by not reducing the company tax rate, the government has turned its back on moves to keep the economy globally competitive. Now it must focus on getting the settings right to attract and secure large investors. Well, for more on this and a look back at the key business policies of the last year, BCA CEO Jennifer Westergott joins me. You must have had, Jennifer, about the toughest job in yeah, business. Yeah, it's not been an easy year. year, that's for sure. Well, you're still here and there's plenty to do, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've come back on my EFO. Of course, you know, business did not get their company tax sure. through. I suppose that was one of the the biggest pieces of news this year, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was a real blow, and I think, I've said before, I think a terrible mistake by the Parliament. I mean, to be fair to the government, they pushed it as hard as they can. Um, you know, business investment is low, it's been revised down again, it's the thing that drives uh, um, innovation, it's the thing that drives the capacity to keep people competitive, that's what drives higher wages. You just have to look around the world, Tiki, and say, we're going to have a two-tier tax rate mm. and we're competing in, in a world where there is a big competition for investment and money. Um, we're going to compete with Asia at 22%, the Americans at 21%, the British at 17%. And energy prices. And energy prices well. and higher regulation. You sort of say, 
you know, in a, in a country already struggling mm. to get businesses to invest, which drives all these important things, which of course are central to wages growth, yep. what, what are we going to do? If we're not going to lower... Well, let me throw that back on you, because this is spilt milk now, really, of course, isn't it, the <coughs> tax cuts? So what are we going to do? Well, if you're not going to do that, then you have to double down on, on reducing the red tape burden to companies. I mean, that is just, you know, I mean, whenever I travel around the world, people kind of go, boy, it's hard to do business in Australia. Mm. And um, translating that, because people say red tape, what yeah, it well, you know, mean? why does it take sort of seven years to get a planning approval for a major project, be that an energy project or a major construction project? Do you think that's improving on the given we've got a little this bit, structure boom? A little now? bit, a little bit, but you know, it, it, it's got to be a lot faster because you know companies can go and do things in other uh, locations. We've still got, I think, a big amount of work to do to, on the skills front to make sure we've got skilled labour. Uh, we've got to make sure that if we're not going to do company tax, we do something else, like a depreciation allowance, uh, yeah. and make sure that that's broad across the economy. Do you think that's on the cards, though? Well, Labor has certainly proposed that as part of its, uh, its election yeah. platform. It's a very small scheme, and, and, and but look, you know, it's a, it's a good scheme, and we were very positive about it. But, yeah. you know, look, ultimately, governments are going to have to confront this reality. A two-tier tax system which will penalise people going into that from 50 million We've got plus. this nine point something billion dollars uh, yeah. in the war chest that MyEFO has sort of have revealed. Uh, people say that's going to be tax cuts, probably income tax cuts. Uh, it'll be income tax cuts, I'm, I'm sure. And look, you know, I understand the politics of that, but at some point, you know, people have to remember that it is the business community that, that has got my info into the position that it's in. I mean, $86 billion of extra company tax well, up yeah, from 71. Revenues and, 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 the jobs. And, and the jobs. Now, I, I don't want to be unfair to the government because I think they have exercised a lot of fiscal discipline. Mm. You know, they've kept growth in spending at 1.9 per cent. That, that's been hugely important. They have not added to spending. But you can't deny that the success of Australian companies, the success uh, of companies operating here, has really put a lot of money into so that bottom line. So I think line. the other thing that business has been, certainly all the leaders, or so many of the leaders I speak to, is this constant fear that whatever sector they're in these days, there'll be some sort of intervention. Yeah, and I think there is this kind of race to the bottom of who can be meaner to business. Mm. The problem with that is you're just being mean to workers mm. because the, the, the harder we make it to do business, to invest, to grow, to compete on the world stage, and that is the world we're in. We're not America. We can't turn our back on the, on the global economy. We're not big enough. We make it really hard. Uh, I listen to people in India and parts of Asia. They are opening up their economies to investment from all around the world. We yes. have to compete with those people. And, you know, if we turn our back on investment, we're turning our back on being able to create more jobs, being able to pay people more. Yes. And I think we've just got to kind of have a bit of a line in the sand and remember that, you know, it's business this year. Who, who was employing 11 million people, who created yeah. 400,000 jobs, who's yeah. paid $86 billion in company so tax. So we've still got this massive... Don't bite the hand that kind of... Right, we've still you know, got this massive problem, which is a global problem, of, of lack of wages growth. Yeah. Now, yeah. really interesting, I thought, in the ALP conference, uh, and somewhat surprisingly, that we've, we've had... that We knew that there was going to be, in some low-income sectors, uh, the idea of uh, bargaining within sectors would, would be put forward. Uh, now now it looks as though, looking at what Brendan, Brendan O'Connor said, it, it, they're going to have some sort of industry-wide bargaining if collective bargaining falls over. Now that's quite a development. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the sort of thing where you know business needs some certainty here. This is not something you just oh, we'll sort this out in government. Let, let me go back to why industry bargaining is such a big issue for us, because basically you're saying that a um, and a, a big union in one part of the country is going to set not just the wages and conditions, yep. but the way things are going to be done, the rostering, the training. Um, and that's going to apply to a, a business in another part of the country who's in a different market, who's got a different profile. Mm. They might be in the broad industry, but they've got a different set of customers, a different set of problems. You're going to have to live with that industry. Now, what companies tell me is, apart from the fact this won't work, um, it would just put a lot of people out of business and I can't see how this can work. So you're going to want to talk obviously to yeah. to, to, the, to, to Labor Party uh, policy uh, makers. Yeah, and what, what are we trying Tanya to fix Blibisex here? What push uh, for uh, more gender equity say between you know a steel, uh, somebody in manufacturing, steel manufacturing and somebody in childcare, they've both done three years of training, uh, one lot gets way less than, than the other and retooling the Fair Work Commission 
to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I think there's a, there's a whole lot of inequities in some of these things. Then we have to kind of address that. The question is how all this gets paid for. Yes. Uh, but you know, well, no one's suggesting. I think that. Oh, sorry, the Labor's suggesting that in in childcare, it's a bit of a special case, isn't it? With um, yeah. you know, w women going off to have children. Um, I suppose, but that, that they'll pay for it. Yeah. Well, it will be the taxpayer who's paying for it. Yes. So, look, you know, I, I, I'm not going to begrudge childcare workers mm. getting uh, getting more pay. You know, I think to be fair, you know, this has got to be part of a broader kind of um, review because of. Because we do have the equity, correct? The inequity problem. Yeah, yeah. And and I thought it was really interesting. New Start, neither yeah. Labor nor the Liberal Party want to di directly do something about new starts yeah, yeah. and can jump I'll, up and I'll, down come, as much I'll come back like. to that but I just want to finish on the on the wages issue and on the industrial bargaining mm. industry based bargaining the, what we did some research recently which showed that the people whose jobs were at the highest risk of retrenchment were the people who had the least amount of change in their jobs and so the more you make it difficult for people to sit down together in their workplace and work out how they do things more efficiently, how they adopt new technology, the more at risk those jobs will be. Now, if you've got a big union uh, telling a small company or a, or a mid-sized or a large company in another part of the economy, sorry guys, mm -hmm. this is, gonna ha is, is how it's going to be, irrespective of yeah. your circumstances. How on earth is that going to work? in a way that doesn't kind of actually put more jobs at risk. And I mean, we've got a system that Labor created, an enterprise bargaining system that's worked very well, that's driven productivity, it's driven higher wages. Uh, you know, we've got an independent umpire. What are we going to say, you know, that an EBA is approved and someone doesn't like it, so yeah. now everyone's going to be on that. All right, that's well, not I'm sure work. business will be back at Chris Bowe and yeah. ask you what, what, what do you what, mean? What now, he's, he's now, can I come back to New Start? Yes. I mean, this is the issue with this discussion about inequality. So, to me, it's, it's you know, if you kind of say, the Productivity Commission says all income groups have been, uh, have uh, got better off. Yes. But that doesn't make it better for people who are doing it tough, of course. But we've got this um, false class war this um, abstract conversation about the technical measure of inequality when what we should be doing is doubling down on the people who are really doing it tough now yeah. the people so we need to do something about new absolutely yeah. there are 23,000 people on new start who've been on it for 10 years yeah. now, so, the, the, so what, what are the politicians doing why aren't we fixing that i mean yeah. the, the allowance for, for single people is very low yeah it's inadequate yeah. it doesn't need an inquiry it needs fixing all right briefly uh you know we've got I think it's acknowledged now both sides of, of uh, both the coalition and Labour. There are people who just hate business on both sides and want to intervene, and there are people who are open to talking to business. I mean, we used to think about the Wayne Swan class warfare, but equally now we've got down down interventionists on, on, on both yeah. sides. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I think I think this is a real danger signal because, as I said, you know we want that 86 billion dollars of yeah. tax to pay. We want business to create those 400,000 jobs and another 400,000 and another 400,000. We want them to invest, but if we keep sending a signal, yes. no matter who's in government, so, that Australia is too hard to do business in, yep. there are lots of places so where people finally, can do it. So finally, how does the big end of town see us? Is this a, a low a line in the sand now? Is this is the low point? Are we going to have to wait for Hain on February the 1st to just really regroup after after that? I mean, when we think we've got two AGMs or bank AGMs mm. this week, we've got two probably two strikes all up on the remuneration report. We've got to think about this, don't we? Absolutely. I think there is a line in the sand now because, you know, we want, a you know, this is not about people sitting around board tables. This is around about the 11 million people who work in a business. This is about, you know, the people whose superannuation depends on a business to succeed. This is about every Australian's future. And if, if we want to just get into a new national sport of business bashing, and as I said earlier, have a race to the bottom of being mean to business and who can be mean to business. Boards are really going to have to They're going to have to double down. I agree with that. And they're yeah. going to have to double down on on, laser focus on their customers, laser focus on their shareholders, laser focus on making sure their processes, their products, um, you know, actually and work for their and customers how and how they get paid themselves. Yeah. And when there's a problem, conspicuously fixing it and making sure that they have fixed it and fixed it properly. Jennifer Westercott, a very big job this year. And yeah. I see you got another one next year. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Happy Christmas. Yes, you too. After the break, we'll get a few key takeaways from the ALP conference with the Australian Workers' Union National Secretary, Daniel Walton. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. 
Welcome back and welcome back to National Politics. Well, Nationals MP Andrew Broad has confirmed he won't be contesting his seat next election after allegations the married MP met up with a woman of a sugar daddy website. Sky News political reporter Annalise Nielsen joins me live from Canberra. Annalise, never a dull moment. <laughs> uh, we thought this was going to be all about the ALP conference, but no. Well, I think uh, the Liberals weren't counting on this headline either. It's been quite controversial because it is the second really salacious rumour to be somewhat confirmed coming out of the Nationals. We know Barnaby Joyce was uh, forced to fall on his sword over his affair with Vicky Campion earlier in the year because they did indeed welcome a child. But now it's Andrew Broad, a relatively unknown Nationals MP from regional but, but, Victoria. He was also who, very critical of Barnaby Joyce at the time. He was the first for, to call for Barnaby Joyce to step down over what he saw as really uh, a poor character and a breach of family values that the party mm -hmm. stood for. And so it has been very swift retribution. It's worth noting Barnaby Joyce has been very cordial about this whole thing. He was uh, chased by a camera crew yesterday and he was uh, saying that he just feels sorry for the family. And so that's, that's, um, that's quite uh, coll collegiate for... for um, Yes. For Barnaby Joyce, he deserves that credit, but it is something where the Nationals are really fighting against this image that they're bad with women. This morning, the papers were reporting that the Nationals party has had three women come forward this year already about complaints over Andrew Broad, and so it is something that they've denied, but it uh, goes to this bigger picture problem that they're having with uh, dealing with women. There's only two women in the Nationals at the moment, and so it's something they've wow. fought against, but he hasn't fought against these allegations. He very quickly stood down from his junior junior ministerial role and then this afternoon he announced that he will indeed not contest the next election and make way for someone who's uh, probably in a better position to do so. The criticism now has been at Michael McCormack about how he's handled it. He was caught out saying that he only found out about it two weeks ago. It turns out it was actually six weeks ago and it seems like he was very much avoiding having to bring it up with the Prime Minister at all. Right, OK. Michael has uh, acted here entirely appropriately. Uh, uh, my understanding is that Michael had uh, uh, very scant information a few weeks ago about the circumstance, uh, circumstances involved here, and, and uh, they obviously didn't meet a threshold uh, to take uh, any further action apart from what Michael has said, uh, asking or, or, or advising Andrew to refer to some of the matters to police, which would, had been done. Now, Tiki, this is all just more fodder for the opposition in particular. The Liberals were furious that they lost their big headline announcement from MAIFO yesterday and about that big budget surplus that they're going to deliver. But I did want to show you what one Liberal uh, MP had to say, Michelle Rowland. I think she really hit the nail on the head about the ongoing frustration that many are having with uh, a bit of the chaos within the Nationals Party. Well, he was very fond of quoting Billy Graham uh, on occasion. Uh, but look, let's not sugarcoat this. It's a very sticky situation. So you know, we awake to see what's happening. But in the meantime, questions are being asked about who knew what when. And now we have these allegations of public funds being used or misused. Who knew what when? When was the AFP involved and why? Quite frankly, I don't know where people get the time to do this sort of thing. Annalise, as if there needed to be anything else, there was yet another story, uh, another, another raid. A raid indeed in Sydney and on Sussex Street at the Labor Party headquarters. The Labor Party now confirmed that that was an ICAC raid and it's in relation to a 2015 fundraiser done with Chinese counterparts looking for donations from the Labor Party there. That's all the details they've given us so far but we know that was a tumultuous time for the Labor Party with some of their funding arrangements in particular with their arrangements with the Chinese and so this is likely a continuation of that but we haven't got any more information some of the other discussions that are happening is apparently they knew that this raid was going to happen today and so they were bracing for it. We've had some discussions about whether that would be necessarily normal procedure or not but uh, it seems like this is just the start of what's going to be another very difficult chapter for the Labor Party dealing with uh, ICAC. Yeah, well, indeed. But sorry, we're a slight nick for at the ALP today. But really, uh, most of the mud seemed to stick with the government. Annalise Nielsen, thank you very much for joining us.
Well, let's head back to the ALP, ALP conference. Uh, one up-and-coming delegate in attendance at the conference this week, this week was the Australian Workers' Union National Secretary, Daniel Walton. I spoke to him earlier this morning, I should mention, just ahead of the, all the stuff that we've been hearing about on IR. So earlier this morning in Adelaide, just ahead of the proceedings. Dan Walton, nice to catch you there ahead of the last day. Now, very interesting, the mood at the conference. Pretty united front. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, everyone's got that Christmas spirit only a couple of days away now until we finish up for the year. And obviously, this conference has been a long time coming. Having been originally scheduled for earlier in the year, it's been shifted to close to Christmas. I think everyone's in a good spirit trying to get all the important business done and head on uh, home for the holidays. Yeah, but I guess the crucial thing is obviously to have that united front going into this very important election. You don't want to, another grab of defeat from the jaws of victory, which is what happened when John Howard got re-elected. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think everyone's united for one purpose, and uh, Bill Shorten and a lot of the team have spoken heavily about stability over the last couple of days, and I think that's shone through. I think there's a really unified bunch of people um, the Labor Party is a very diverse party. We've got all sorts of interesting characters, but everyone's coming together because they know the most important thing is getting a change of government, be it uh, March or more likely May next year. And so I think that's been presented and shown uh, to Australians right around the country that there is a group of people, a smart group of people, that are ready to lead the country. OK, so let's go through some of the policies. There was a push for industry-wide bargaining on the IR front. Where is this ending up? Uh, well, it hasn't ended up at this stage. Um, industrial relations comes up onto the agenda today. I think it's been a, a culmination of several months uh, worth of work. And so uh, when that hits the floor, obviously it's going to be debated. People are going to be putting up different views and different policies. And then uh, everyone's obviously got a, a right to vote at the end of the day to make a decision uh, in terms of what that outcome will be. What's your expectation? Well, no, I, I don't know how much detail will be arranged today. I think what it will be is... Uh, going through some important principles. There's been some incredible announcements already made uh, in terms of some important changes to be able to address the lack of wages growth, uh, be able to address penalty rates and the like. I think they'll be the centrepiece of the discussions. Yeah, so you're expecting the party then to support bringing back penalty rates? I think so. I think what we've seen is when penalty rates got removed, there was a promise of a, a huge job creation, particularly in the retail sectors. and. Uh, all the research, all the evidence, all the statistics point to the fact that that was just a complete furphy. It just hasn't actually happened. Uh, and so what we've got in Australia, the one thing that everyone agrees on, is we've got a lack of wages growth at this point in time. And the RBA has been calling for um, some additional initiatives to be able to solve the problem. And uh, what we've seen is you know, some of the lowest paid workers uh, in the country are losing their penalty rates, losing their take-home pay, and that's obviously affected people's spending. And, um, so long as we can look at to a solution to be able to bring penalty rates back in, I think we're going to be able to give some additional boost into the economy with people spending some more. Um, and the penalty rates discussion, albeit, has focused around retail in the beginning. Um, what, it, what is also coming down the line is they're trying to take penalty rates away from uh, hairdressers, which are a group of workers which uh, we look after. Uh, and they're also trying to do it for workers in clubs as well. So you don't buy the uh, small business argument that it makes a huge difference to the growth in small business and further employment? Well, nothing is. There's been no evidence to support the cut in penalty rates as being a job creator, and that was one of the biggest arguments that were, was put forward. It hasn't been going for very long. No, it hasn't been going for too long, but it's enough time for the statisticians to be able to go through to do their work, to be able to produce the reports as to whether or not there's been additional jobs created and you know particularly the big employers be it Coles and Woolworths you know there were significant promises made in terms of additional jobs created and that just has not stacked up. Okay look uh, another thing that must please you and your members is the position that Labor has come to uh, on emissions intensive trade exposed industry post the agreement in Poland. Well I, th I think one of the big difficulties for our members is we are a heavy manufacturing union, uh, but we're also a union that operates in the resources sector. And so uh, our members are the people that extract the gas, our members are the people that extract metalliferous mining, iron ore, uh, but our members are also the people at the end of that value chain. So the people in the steel works, the aluminium smelters, the glass works, uh, and they rely upon uh, cheap energy, they rely upon baseload power to, um, to fuel their businesses going forward. And so 
Um, for us, for our union, for the Australian Workers' Union, we are massively leveraged uh, to make sure that we get a good solution on energy. But what we've seen above all else is that companies are crying out for some stability. Um, we had some meetings the last couple of days with some of the business leaders that are over here, and that is one of the big things that they continue uh, to say, that when they go around the world, when they uh, chat to their investors, people are looking into Australia sort of scratching their head as to what's going on. But you are going to get some specific exemptions because uh, obviously Labor's renewable energy targets are high, aren't they? Well, no, I think they're ambitious targets uh, that are in place, but it's part of a narrative which is playing out around the world. I don't think we find ourselves isolated to some of our big competitors. Um, for us, for our union, um, we are certainly playing a large part in those discussions to make sure that there is a sensible transition going through as we head to a more renewables-based economy uh, into the future that we do have some certainty and stability for those heavy intensive industries that do need baseload power. Dan, uh, moving to super, the retail funds live to operate another day, do they? They're not going to be banned? No, that's right. So we, I think we spoke about this last time that we caught up and I, um, you know, I think there's a sensible solution which has been, uh, been uh, come to um, during conference in the last couple of days. Albeit it feels like a week ago, it was only a few days ago that we were having this discussion on the floor of conference. Um, uh, there's an outcome in place which um, obviously means there's going to be some tighter regulations and tighter focus uh, on the retail funds and I think that is a, a sensible outcome. We've still got a bunch of recommendations to come through in the next few weeks from the Royal Commission um, and I'd be absolutely amazed if they don't put a bigger spotlight in terms of the purpose test for retail funds. Equally across funds, including, very importantly, industry funds, I see there's an agreement that members will not be now placed in non-performing funds. Yeah, well, I think this is also one of the big debates and one of the big challenges. But the, all the controversial things that have been proposed about making changes to super and the focus on super have been driven by this government. Uh, they've been the ones that have been having a look at attacking uh, what has now come through, not only in terms of the performance uh, statistics, but also uh, as shown during the Royal Commission, they've been after the industry super funds the entire time. Um, and they've come through in glowing lights, and they come through... Yeah, sure, but the Productivity Commission, I think, points out that there were a fair number of non-performing industry funds as well. So, presumably, this was quite an important motion to get through, that members would no longer be placed in those non-performing funds. Yep, yeah, true, and uh, th that's right, but uh, also I think there is going to be a broader conversation about consolidation uh, for the number of funds going forward. I think it is just a, it's a reality. I know, uh, I know that not all of my peers sort of share that view, but I think uh, eventually some of the, out, um, the underperforming funds, um, be it retail uh, funds primarily, but for any industry funds, I think there will be some consolidation, and um, that is only going to provide additional scale and opportunity for the retirement savings of uh, obviously hundreds of thousands or millions of Australians. Yes, and no fast tracking of compulsory super from 95 to 12% contribution. Presumably uh, that's just practical. I mean, that would go like down like a, a lead balloon in the electorate given the slow wages growth at the moment. Yeah, I think so. And, I, and uh, you know, I think, I don't know if, uh, if, if he's underestimated or not, but Chris Bowen uh, plays an absolutely amazing role inside the, uh, inside the party. And, has got a real sort of tight rein on expenditure uh, across the board and a few people have been up on stage talking about that uh, in terms of uh, trying to get additional funds out for various initiatives and various projects. Uh, Chris has done a very, very good job in making sure that we've got a, a balanced budget and we've got a fantastic suite of initiatives going forward into the election and, and super and the raises into the super guarantee was one of them. And, um, ideally, you know, I think everyone agrees that it has to come up. I think uh, the party uh, entirety agrees that that needs to come up in, a, in terms of its percentage points, but it's really a matter of timing, and that's obviously what we've decided on. And timing, as you say, is everything, and the importance of the United Front ahead of the election. Uh, but the left have been disciplined. Just, um, just look at the refugee policy. I mean, Bill Shorten didn't even mention asylum seekers in his own speech. And there seems to be some sort of agreement there now that uh, you've, you've done to take more refugees. Uh, the left's ambitions have been cut back there. Well, there's been a lot of contentious issues put up, and I think one of the... Uh, the best things about the Australian Labor Party is we're a very open and democratic party. And, you know, we have the media... But well, not always. I mean, you weren't when Kevin Rudd did his Labor conference previously. Couldn't vote, I don't think. Well, 
I can't actually remember that, Tiki. So, uh, uh, but we've, we've had over the last couple of days, we've had obviously a significant number of votes taking place on the floor. We've dealt with a lot of controversial issues. There's uh, been a lot of people disappointed with some of, the, uh, some of the outcomes. We've had a bunch of crazy protesters storming the stage um, to kick us off. Um, but um, like I said, there's, there's a differing, there's a wide range suite of views across the Labor Party. But ultimately, we've gone through to find what is a sensible outcome and really wanted to demonstrate, I guess, to the Australian people that we are the party of stability, that the Australian Labor Party is uh, ideally and hopefully going to be the next government uh, leading this country. And I think Australians have had a look into the next couple of days. You get a chance to have a look under the hood at some of the things that have been discussed and the characters uh, within the party. And I think people will be uh, quite happy uh, to make a decision next year to put Bill Shorten as the next Prime Minister. Finally, Dan, if Aussies do put Bill Shorten down for the next Prime Minister, can they be um, comfortable that some of the super unions won't run away with themselves? I mean, we're just looking yesterday at uh, David Hannan from uh, the CFMEU found guilty of destroying documents. I mean, should Aussies be concerned at the growing power of some of the more militant unions under a shortened government? No, not at all. I don't think anyone should be concerned. I think the reality where things sit at the moment is... Uh, obviously, if you look in terms of a lot of the different measures around the number of days of uh, loss to industrial action, uh, if you have a look in terms of union density across a lot of issues, uh, I think it is overplayed and often, um, you know, obviously beaten up quite a bit uh, in the media and the public eye. Um, I think, like I said before, I think there is uh, a lot of smart people sitting around the table at the moment um, wanting to make sure that we've got the right policies in place, the right ideas in place to make sure that we do help ordinary Australians in terms of lifting their wages to be able to solve this lack of wages growth problem. We've got to tackle the issues in terms of inequality with inequality at all time highs. Um, and these are some of the discussions that are being, uh, that are being had uh, at this point in time. Um, I'm certainly not concerned uh, in terms of any sort of crazy actions or activities that are going to, be, going to be playing out. I think everyone understands that we want to make sure that not only is Bill Shorten elected at the next election, uh, but he is there in place for a long period of time. And that means um, that people need to act responsibly and be sensible um, all the way through uh, into the election and beyond. Dan Walton, well, it sure does look like a pretty disciplined conference. Thanks so much for joining us there. Thanks so much, Tiki. Interesting place, the AWU, Daniel Walton, and before him, Paul Howes, and before him, Bill Shorten. So, watch Dan Walton. After the break, we'll get the latest on the Goldman Sachs 1MDB scandal, plus a wrap of the year for the mergers and acquisitions space. The Australian Scott Murdoch, up next. This is Tiki, on your money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Now, Malaysian authorities have filed charges against American bank Goldman Sachs and two of its former employees in relation to alleged money laundering and corruption. The bank is being investigated for reportedly raising more than six billion U.S. dollars for investment fund. The 1MDB fund was reportedly used to embezzle millions to buy high-end property and even invest in the Wolf of Wall Street movie. Good though that investment was. Goldman Sachs has released a statement saying the charges were misdirected. Malaysia's former Prime Minister, Najib Razak, has been charged with corruption over the fund. And all the way to the top, well, for more on this story, and later a wrap on the biggest mergers and acquisitions of the year, the Australian's data room reporter, Scott Murdoch, joins me live at the desk. Scott, this is a bit of a development. Yeah, it has been, Tiki. This uh, story's been kind of kicking along all year, and we saw uh, earlier in November that two of the former bankers of Goldman Sachs have been charged, but then in the past 24 hours, there's been news that Malaysia has come out and filed corruption, uh, filed charges, I should say, criminal charges, against Goldman Sachs, so they're going to be the looking... The bank as well. The bank as well. So this is a... Well, that's you know, where the money is, presumably. Well, exactly. And this is a, a big kind of development. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, whether the... You know, how the Malaysian government takes on Goldman Sachs. So this is really one of the most powerful organisations in the world. So they've come out and said they're going to fight the charges. They said that, um, you know, it, it's no impediment to them doing business around the world. But if you have a look Probably at... Probably Malaysia. Well, exactly right. <laughs> and you've got to have a look at some of the numbers numbers involved in this are pretty incredible. They, uh, there's talk about they're looking for fines up to $2 billion. Uh, we know Goldman Sachs earned about $600 million in terms of the transactions. Now they're denying 
everything, any wrongdoing? Or? Yeah, yeah, that uh, definitely does seem to be the case. There's a pretty strongly worded statement from Goldman Sachs out of New York last night saying, well, we were in, uh, you know, we had no idea that these funds were allegedly being used for the kind of activities that uh, the Malaysian authorities are saying they've done. And like I said, they're a pretty aggressive organisation, so they're not going to take this down, you know, take this too easily, I would think. Well, Scott Murdoch, let's go to the year that was in M&A because it's a huge uh, year and it's a year of two halves, you reckon? Yeah, it definitely is. I was having a look at some figures uh, just before. So, so far this year, there's been $162 US billion worth of M&A in Australia. That's up from $118 billion US dollars wow. last year. Of course, the biggest deal in that was Westfield. We saw that uh, merger or takeover of sorts from Unibail, but, you know, like... I mean, brilliantly executed by the lowest, you'd have to say, wouldn't you? Wow. Is it? We'll see. Oh, really? <laughs> well, the fact that they, 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 they did to call the top of this. Yeah, yeah, you know, they have everyone saying they've called the top of the cycle, they've moved out of it now. Um, yeah, look, they've got a pretty, they've got an amazing deal mm. out of it. So, but um, as you say, I think it's you know, a little bit of the, the two halves. You've got the big deals which have managed to get done, but also too, there's uh, some pretty mega deals that bankers who've been working on these for a very long time hoped they would have got done and they haven't got done. And of course, that's APA and CKI that we saw last month get kibosh by the well, Treasurer. Well, that was Kevin Gallagher, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah. And the, yeah. and, and the board, yeah. So that, you know... No, uh, oh, sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. You're throwing me off. Of course, yeah. No, no, CKI, so that, that back that, by that was, that, that, was, um, that was Mick McCormack. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that deal worth $13 billion yeah. that Josh Frydenberg put yeah. the uh, uh, hem and that down. And then also before that, getting back to Kevin yeah. Gallagher with Santos, you know, yes. the, the bid from Harbour worth 14.4. So there's nearly $30 billion in two deals which haven't gone ahead this year. So you've got the big ones yes. which have gone ahead and gone well uh, versus those two uh, which haven't. We've also had a really interesting sort of structure where private equity have joined up with industry super. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, that's going to be an interesting trend, I think, Tiki, to watch going into 2019. You need a bit more of it. Well, that's what people say. Uh, you know, the super funds have got a lot of money to spend. Private equity has a lot of money to spend. If you put those two together, then that's a powerful combination, of course. Yeah. Uh, but do you think Labor's sort of industry super with right-wing private equity? Sort of I know, but still, I think it's going to come down to the fact that if they can win deals, they're going to keep on doing that. And there hasn't been a a lot of criticism of the fact that, and you're referring to uh, Oz Super teaming up with BGH first in its bid for um, HealthScope, then also Navitas yes. as well. But there's been no real criticism of that. And I was having an interesting conversation with the bank the other day, who, and he was saying, "Well, I can't believe there hasn't been more criticism. You know, the, the super funds are tying themselves up. They're getting themselves in positions where yeah. they Making have the board, to say no. Very difficult. Have to make yeah, you know, making it really hard. But in terms of the super funds, there's not a lot of ways that they can be criticised. There's no way." AGMs, you know, they've got a lot of members. The members can say we're not happy, but the super funds can still do it anyway. So in terms of transparency, there's not a great deal. Well, that's, that, that's, uh, that's a work in progress, done. isn't it, HealthScope? Uh, we've got two other live deals. Yes, yeah, so you've got Lion Drinks and Dairy, which are out there at the moment. Their first round bids closed last week, and there's talk that private equity is interested there. There are also some uh, industry buyers in there, so Coca-Cola's having a look at it. Uh, the likes of Freedom Foods um, has been touted. Um, you know, the usual private equity names like KAR and PEP. Then also at the end of this week, just before everyone breaks for the holidays, the first round bids for Arnott's is due. Mm -hmm. So we know that... Uh, Campbell's Soup is looking to sell that. It's got its own problems. I remember problems. when they bought it. <laughs> That's, That's how far you go back to yes. <laughs> So they've got their own problems in the US, so they think if they can carve out the Australian business here, and you know, there's talk that that's going to be worth like two to three billion dollars. That's a big size deal that the market uh, and, has to swallow next year. And one very big deal that, again, people thought David Teo was very clever with his timings, is selling. Mm. Uh, or joint merging with Vodafone, TPG and Vodafone. Yeah. But we've now seen the regulator sort of voice a little bit, a bit of concern about this. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, you know, for those two to go together, that was going to create a, you know, a big market uh, force. Well, the in number there. three player. Yeah, the number three player. I saw some figures, you know, $15 billion merger. The ACCC has come out and raised some issues. I think the you know, a, a firmer decision is due by March next year. Um, speaking to people in the market, they're still confident this is going to go ahead. Now, whether it does or not in its current form, you would think they would be looking to try and make some concessions. I know, you know when bankers and advisors are working on these kind of deals, they want to get them done because, of course, they don't pay it if they don't get done. Mm. So you'd have to think they would be in there trying to uh, you know, come to some sort of arrangement. One, one uh, lot of advisors who would have done all right is BHP and shale. Yep.
They did actually get it away. They did get that away. That was one that took a very long time. And, uh, you know, the sale price of $10 billion sounds good, a uh, you know, headline number, but look how much BHP had pumped into that. Uh, firstly, the acquisitions, then they doubled down, invested in it. And, you know, they just, it was one of Marius Klopper's uh, investments that just seemingly well, didn't go well. A lot of people putting Andrew McKenzie up there as a, one of the CEOs for the year for doing it. Um, I mean, it's for getting it done. Yeah, well, well it's his job, I would have think. It is his job, that's yeah. exactly right. It's also extinguishing, uh, you know, you've got to look at how much shareholder wealth mm. has been extinguished over that time. So the fact you can get $10 billion out of it, well, yeah, that's probably maybe a good outcome now, but you've got to look at it in context. Finally, Grain Corp, where are we going with that? Ah, one of my favourite stories at the moment, Tiki. So you've got the due diligence is underway. Yes. Uh, the consortium is in there at the moment, long term asset partners. They'll probably be in there for about four weeks to six weeks. Crash Craddock and Tony Shepherd? Yeah, exactly right. Now that's a combination, but again, there's no details. This is what I find amazing. So due diligence, they've been allowed due diligence, mm. perpetual, uh, I was told, pushed Grain Corp into a, to setting up a data room. Yes. No one knows what this bid is worth. We know, uh, sorry, how this bid is made up. We know they're taking like a $3 billion loan from Goldman Sachs. Look yes. at the price of that. You know, and we're dealing with a major piece of national infrastructure here that is, you know, so important to not only Australia's food, pro you know, not only yes. to exports, but Australia's food production. Yes. So I... Well, it wasn't allowed to be sold to... to well, exactly Americans. right, yeah. so, um, when that was the right. case. All right, well, that is a work in progress. Lots to think about trailing into New Year as well. Scott Murdoch, happy Christmas. Thank you so you much too. for joining us. Thanks, Dickie. OK, after the break, the ASX taking a slide amid a global sell-off of markets. We'll get some market analysis with investments. InvestSmart's Evan Lucas next. Now, back to Tiki. Yeah, welcome back. Let's end with the markets and uh, the ASX 200 closing down over a 1.2% today amid a global sell-off, so no Santa rally really. NAB and Westpac both hit six-year lows in today's session. This ahead of key AGM for NAB and also ANZ tomorrow. Internationally, we've also seen a speech today by China's President Xi Jinping, we talked about that earlier, who addressed the nation on his 40 years of economic reforms. Uh, for analysis, Chief Market Analyst at, at InvestMart joins me live from Melbourne. Evan Lucas, g'day there. Can I start with the banks, um, who seem to have had a bit of a, a, a sort of uh, slacking today, but people are just worried about these AGMs? Why do you think that is? No, I think it's more than that, Tiki. I, I think it's sort of the spread out from, from what we've been seeing globally. So the, the whole mm. bank movement at the moment is is a spread out of, of credit issues, not just here in Australia, but credit issues globally. What happened on Thursday around the Fed, there's certainly a lot of movements going in, in those sort of corporate debt markets as well. All of that is sort of culminating to why banks are under real pressure. It's not just an Australian issue either. So if you look into Europe and you look at the stock 600, their 48 uh, listed banks over there are having one of their worst years in the post-GFC world. They're down as much as 27% as a group. If you look into the States as well, I know you were talking about before the break with Goldman Sachs, but if you put in all the big five major US banks, they too are suffering one of their worst years they've had all year. So it's not just yes. around what's going on here. However, let's have a look, and particularly looking on screen, the, the ANZ number today is really interesting. So there is this suggestion that there is sort of largest exposure to uh, New Zealand, but also the fact that they've seen a pop-up in coal in their, in their overexposure is not Yeah, great. that was interesting they, today. Yeah, yeah, it was. And it's always been a risk factor that a lot of uh, sort of investment banks point out is that ANZ has the highest level of exposure to resources. It's about 27 mm. percent, give or take, mm. uh, of their overall business lending book is, is in that space. So to see that tick up is interesting. They are being very much pushed on ESG, so their economic, social and governance. And that filters into your question for tomorrow. So there will yes. be big questions around their corporate governance and their structure. Clearly, they are going to get a bit of a wrap on the knuckles around the Banking Royal Commission. But also, are they taking the right steps to be moving into the next generation banking space? And that's probably what you're going to hear. Yep. You can't also deny that their overall performance is, is a real problem and how they're going to stand that flow with the yeah. housing market doing what it's doing. OK, so uh, we had West back. Uh, they got a strike. Are we going to get another strike between ANZ and NAB, do you think? Mate, look, if I was going to put you know, one between either of them, it's NAB. NAB would yeah. be more likely the one that I would probably single out that would probably and, get that And strike. what do you make of CEO Andrew Thorburn um, yeah. taking a couple of months out? Yeah, it's not a great look. Look, 
uh, what I'll say is that obviously we, we don't know, you know, the exact reasoning behind it. And, yeah. you know, it, it does sound like there are legitimate reasons. But yeah. again, it isn't a great look at this point of the cycle. He is, adverted commas, the youngest in the group in terms of where he sits in his CEO tenureship. So he, he's not really, oh, sorry, Brian Harter is. But you, yeah. in that respect, it, it, he still hasn't been in the game long enough to really be suggesting that he's under a scenario where he needs long service leave. So that, yeah. that I think is, it's not a fantastic look saying he's out till February. Yeah. There could be some really big times going on in January. I think January is going to be a really big, interesting core month for a lot of this space. 2019, I think the market's going to really try and pressure these kind of players, the banks particularly, to sort of come out and really stem right. the tide and say, look, this is where we are going forward. All right, briefly, got to ask you about retail come Christmas. What's going on? Look, it's, it's not great, and, and that's you know that, that's that's a given. Even with what we saw leading up to Christmas, particularly in November, around you know the, the Singles Day, Black Friday sales were really good. You've got to single out what happened overnight over in the UK. ASOS, you know, they, they are the original online provider uh, in mm. what they are, had a really bad profit downgrade, and you're hearing it anyway that the overall commitment from consumers hasn't been great, and that particularly discretionary spend is finding it tough and I, you're seeing that here with our discretionary retailers but globally as well so when you get those retail sales in january for the christmas numbers don't be surprised that they unfortunately disappoint for what was expected to be a better than than normal christmas considering what we saw at the end mm. of september it mm. just doesn't seem that and again screen on the, the sorry the charts on screen tell you that that's clearly the case in where the market's pricing it I think everybody's got to think really hard about their New Year re resolutions. Evan Lucas, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Tiki. OK, and that's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, a uh, special in-depth sit-down with ACCC chairman Rod Sims. See you tomorrow night at 4.30pm or tonight on Catch Up at 10pm. Thanks for your company.